Väga tänan. Thank you very much for having come here. Thank you to all the speakers who over the course of yesterday and today have brought us ideas about being human, looking at it from different perspectives. And I am now taking up the opportunity to do that as well. I would like to speak about being human, having imagination, and how those two are interconnected. But before I start, Allow me to share a, a story which might sound familiar to anyone having teenage children. And when you are in such a situation, they might not be funny, but looking back at them, um, we can see a sort of internal joke in the situation as well. Well, it's a, it's a very short episode from the life of a friend of mine. He has uh, two teenage children and one of those children, his 16-year-old son, uh, requested this summer that he would like to stay out for the night with his peers, whose parents had completely accidentally left the home uh, for the weekend. Uh, this last fact obviously was not mentioned by this 16-year-old boy to his father. My friend, the father, took some time to think and, after long consideration, decided to trust his son. And when the evening arrived, he embraced his son, looked him in the eye and said, be human. The son nodded in trust, went to the party and got drunk. When I heard this, I was amazed. Now, how come it's always that the life speaks the loudest? And this episode also made me think once again about what it actually means to ask somebody to behave like a human, or this yearning to be a human, the hope to meet a human person in oneself, in one's child, in one's employer, colleague, or in the form of the cashier who you meet at the end of the day when you're dead tired and have forgotten your pin code. Seeking a human being, Diogenes cried out, and together with him, we are crying out as well. Who, what does it mean to be human? Who is this creature who has a nervous system that allows it to lie, behave aggressively, be unfaithful, be self-destructive, destroy others? kill and provide endless justifications to it all. And then at the same time, also a being burning with eternal yearning for love, wish and ability to give oneself fully, to sacrifice the last piece of, piece of bread to the brother, create sublime music or hold children until they fall asleep. When uh, a, one of the biggest modern thinkers uh, of Estonia, classic scholar Mario Lepaja was asked, you, oh, as you have perused lots of texts from the antiquity, you know our contemporary world, what would you say to characterize a human person? And the reply was paradoxicality. The theological understanding of human is similar. Existence in an infinite field of tension created in the image of God with a potential of likeness to God while living in a fallen state, feeling impulses, being capable of ideas, words, and actions, unspeakable, confusing. 
Um, that reminds me of myself as a child and an adolescent. I remember that at some point I really felt an urge to understand myself. It, it was formulated into a question, who or what am I? I passionately wanted to gain knowledge about myself and I didn't know how to find out. As a child, when I met a girl who looked a bit like me, for example, fair-haired and, and possibly sort of tiny, then I would sometimes follow this girl and watch her to see what she was like. Um, myself and the mirror weren't enough for me. I mean, it's a childish and, and funny way of gaining knowledge, but I think it speaks about the basic human need of, of perceiving oneself as a whole and understanding what one has in common with others. And, and searching for this knowledge, I discovered the written, written world. Um, my parents worked in a theatre. This means that they were very often away in the evening. And I used to read myself to sleep. I fell asleep in a bed covered in books. First of all, um, I loved fairy tales. I read any fairy tale I could get my hands on. But one day I ran out of them and then I started bringing home uh, works of Astrid Lindgren from the library. And um, on the day when I had reached a chapter in Chorven, Batsman and Moses, where the Chorven's dog, Batsman, was about to be shot and Chorven was saying goodbye to him, I noticed that the page that I was about to turn seemed somehow lumpy. For, for a second I wondered and then I moved along with the story and in a few minutes I, I felt tears of compassion falling down from my pa face onto the page in the book so that the text was in danger of flowing away. And I suddenly felt that the person who had been reading this book before me had felt the same compassion. And I s somehow sensed an all-encompassing unity with all the readers before me. Of course, Jorven and Batsman and Moses and Astrid Lindgren all fictional heroes and all human beings who had been alive before me. They sort of made up a fully tangible whole and I was with them in there. And I noticed in myself a sort of infinite tenderness for them. And this experience was a shock. Later, when I thought about it, I understood that us human beings, we have some kind of a common space where we can connect to anyone, where we can partake in the wisdom, suffering or search for truth of the people who lived before us. And that is the space I would like to think about today with you. The imaginary space and the gift of imagination uh, which has interested me for quite some time and which is an everyday mm, of everyday importance to be in my work with children. Albert Einstein, who is one of the biggest proponents of imagination, says that imagination is the basis of culture. It is a sacred gift and that rationality should 
be a servant to imagination. Anything that we see right now around us has started out in the imagination of someone, and then the ideas have materialized. But the gift of imagination comes with a certain risk. This imaginary space is easy to break in. It can be filled with destructive thoughts, ideas and images that will start to form and, and misguide people. It's, it's a very wide and serious topic which would probably take a conference on its own. But I will come back to it briefly later. But how to define imagination? What is it? In our everyday language, we say that imagination or fantasy is something that is not real, something that is not true. In scientific language, it's quite the opposite. Imagination is something that helps us enter into the reality more deeply. It is a process that takes uh, images, ideas and symbols that one has perceived in the past and creates new mental systems on the basis of them. Um, it has a sort of go-between position between perception and thinking and thinking and memory. And since imagination works with images, symbols and ideas, it allows people to focus on solving complex problems and finding new ideas. Secondly, imagination allows us to regulate emotional states. It allows us to ease tension created by emotions. And this important ability is developed and used in psychotherapy. Thirdly, imagination takes part in planning and programming. As imagination allows us to cross the limits of time and space, a person can already, before they start a certain work, imagine its uh, final result. And one of the most extraordinary components of imagination is visualization. Experience as well as research show that the human brain doesn't differentiate between actual action and imagined action. An outstanding young Estonian violinist, Hans Christian Alvik, has said that uh, one of his uh, practice methods includes imaginary practice. For example, if he has been practicing a piece by Mozart in his mind for one week, then his fingers are able to play it. Amazing. And he says that if he had started practicing on the violin right away, studying the piece would have taken two, three months. And finally, imagination has an important uh, role to play in the developing empathy. And based on all of this, we can understand that imagination is an extraordinary tool that we can develop and use. Lev Vygotsky, an important psychologist of the 20th century, has stated that the miracle of imagination lies in the fact that we are no longer limited to the very confined, we are no longer confined to our, our narrow personal cell, but we can expand our experience through the experience of others. And let's now move on to the school. This is the place where our children every day work using their memory, focus, thoughts and perception. Those cognitive processes should be running full time. But I now like to conjure up an image. If we as teachers do not engage their imagination, they are like airplanes, their motors, their engines might start, they might even roll around in the airfield, but they will not take off. By now we have a certain understanding by brain researchers on what it means to learn. 
Jan Arl, who has also been a guest at our school, often underlines that as teachers we should not focus on what to teach but on how to teach. And he recommends that we as teachers should try to place ourselves inside the brain of a student. We should try to think like the student. It is always a rule that uh, what we retain by way of knowledge depends on what it can be associated with from earlier knowledge. And this association is, depends on imagination. Imagination is a tool that composes new systems from existing images, signs, symbols, ideas. But how to wake this imagination? I believe that this is not that complicated. It is The question is more in how to wake the wake up the imagination and creativity in us grown-ups. I'd like to give you an example from when I was a student at school. I went to a school that was called the first secondary school of Rakvere and we had a legendary mathematics and physics teacher, Bai White, that's how we called him. Later it turned, turned out that his actual name was Ado Bai. That came as a great surprise. He was an old man. He wore a grey creased suit. He used to wear sloppy slippers. He had cutting humour and shiny childish eyes. He was somebody who had witnessed a lot in his life. He had the habit of uh, shouting out the topic for the day uh, at the other end of the corridor. We were inside the classroom and then we heard him shouting in the corridor, momentum in free fall. What? And once again, he somehow heard our what and repeated perhaps sounding sometimes like a crow, momentum in free fall. So, slippers coming closer, speeding up, and by the time Pai White sent to the classroom, everybody, were waiting for, everybody was waiting for him. He ran to the teacher's table, climbed on the table, jumped down with a great bang, and said, well, that's what you saw was the momentum of free fall. And the next sentence was test. He gave everyone a piece of paper and then he said, uh, please write a few lines about how you imagine the momentum of free fall. And then after that, we started studying what was in the textbook. But now analyzing what he was doing from the point of view of modern theories on learning. So what, what did he do? First of all, he grabbed our attention, he surprised us, surprised us, amused us, launched our imagination, activated existing preliminary knowledge, and now we were ready to accept new knowledge. Our brains were ready to associate. Uh, Rainer Sarnet here uh, spoke about uh, his dramaturgy teacher who said that uh, the audience is a great peak wishing to discover everything themselves. I can assure that the same applies to students. Children want to create new knowledge on their own. Very often we hear the question from our students, why do we need this? I'm not going to do anything with this in, in real life. And this mainly means one thing. It means that the students uh, are not able, without our help, to embrace the knowledge that we try to teach them. They feel that the teacher is someone who is taking the duff of the curriculum and trying to put it in or on their heads, instead of taking the duff and making bread together. 
And I believe that whatever I'm calling baking here is taking place in the oven of imagination. My subject at St. John's School is Uh, study of humans. And uh, we are using narrative pedagogy. I work with stories, and this engages children's imagination as it is. But what is happening when a child is hearing a story? How can he or she make the story their own? Uh, I mentioned that children need to embrace the new knowledge. They, they need to understand that it has a meaning for them. May I uh, use the ideas of J.R. Tolkien, who has said, if the story says he climbed a mountain and saw a river down in the valley, then every listener hears their own image, which is a composition of all the mountains, rivers, and valleys they have ever seen, and especially the mountain, river, or valley that first came, that first associated with this word for them. So this very clearly explains that imagination uses the pre-existing material uh, that exists in the life. The life, the child is taking a journey and every event that happens uh, to the characters in the story becomes part of the child's experience um, because it relates to the problem that the, the child is, is currently facing. But it takes focus. Jan Aru says something similar. Contents of the memory are the patterns of connections in your brain. And changing them needs to be difficult because we don't want random things, for example, passing cars to change the structure of our memories. To learn something, the brain has to work hard. Some things come easier to some students because they have preliminary knowledge of something on something which have come from home. And it makes it easier to learn some things. But it's not impossible for other children as well. Simply, if students have very different preliminary knowledge, they have very different structure of knowledge on something, the speed of learning differs a lot, and where they will end up will also be different. In, in some way, I would um, agree with the idea of not trying to teach all students the same things with the same tempo. Uh, instead, it might make sense, especially in the older forms, to find the niche in a student's head where they have a lot of preliminary knowledge and where the, where the brain wants to go. So every child, in every child's brain, there is huge potential. It needs to be found out, and this needs to be used. The end of the quote by Jan Aru here. So what should we conclude from here? I believe that we should not write off students. We cannot divide them into talented and not talented, or smart and slow. We should um, turn our... Um, turn our eyes towards our teaching methods and ask whether we can be more creative in approaching our subject. Yesterday, at the conference, I met a young person whom I had not seen for about 10 years. And we spoke, and this person said that they had become a math teacher. I was really amazed. I asked, what do you do to teach this, this subject? And they said that they taught it like a language. For them, mathematics is a language with words, sentences, syntax, 
That was very inspiring. I wanted to learn more. My imagination started to work, but then we had to move on. I, I saw this person in the hall today. I'm not sure, but I hope that they're here. L allow me to touch upon um, a dangerous aspect related to um, imagination, which we see in our everyday school life as well. These are the challenges related to our digital era. And I think that there are two sides or two moments here. Uh, before the digital era, uh, the world of the child, the contents of, of the child's memory was formed on the basis of the real world. Of course, nobody has ever been uh, safeguarded from uh, painful experiences which which may leave the child with destructive images or ideas or emotions. But I believe that, that those real-life destructive ideas could be uh, organized quite well, because life often pointed out the ideas of cause and effect. But a modern child may make one click and be overflown through by unimaginable images and a knowledge that will be stored in the imaginary space, and this will eat up the child on the inside. I, I have also witnessed uh, that uh, imagination have become, has become more limited recently. An, an example from the class of uh, third form children, we are talking about myths from ancient Greece, and in the beginning of a lesson I asked uh, children to close their eyes and imagine that they're in a transparent, shiny sea, and then they feel somebody touching their rib, and there are dolphins coming to them, and then they will ride the dolphins onto the open sea. During this imagination exercise, I saw some of the children like uh, crying out of joy because they felt the, the dolphins. But we also have the children who say that they can't see anything, that they are seeing a black hole or something that's becoming increasingly um, common, that they, when they close their eyes, they see video clips that they have seen the previous day. And no matter how they tried, those children were not able to launch their imagination. It is only one little aspect in a huge uh, array of problems, but knowing how, how early in their life uh, children are imprisoned in the world of, of smartphones, we have to conclude that we don't know what will come out of this uh, experiment. Developmental psychologists are saying that, that uh, smartphones act as drugs, those, those outcries do not reach everyone. At our school, we have managed to enforce the elementary rule that our children do not use smartphones uh, during the school day, if then in older forms and uh, for study purposes. But when Albert Einstein uh, complained about uh, reason being given to higher status and, and said that the sacred gift of imagination should you know be on the throne and, and served by reason, then currently I think we're in a situation where this sacred gift has been tied up, a madman is on the throne and reason cannot do anything about it or does not dare do anything about it. So I must confess I'm a bit worried about the digital reality today because I can see children you know, basically babies in in uh, buggies, uh, on buses, um, in parks, frozen into scrolling. And finally, um, if I try once again to formulate what is the objective of education, then Alexander Filonenko, who just spoke to us, has said that uh, the task of the human life is not 
gathering knowledge on what surrounds us, but using this knowledge to create authentic relations uh, with the reality. So we should not run away from the reality, we should stay in contact with reality. And if imagination takes us away from reality, it may be dangerous and it may break us, because in the depths uh, inside a human being, there is a huge need to open ourselves up to the reality which has been put there through creation. Um, in the ancient Greece tradition, humans were seen as microcosms. But from the first century, people uh, have been spoken about, about not only as microcosm, but also someone who contains parts of God, the, the image of God. In the Genesis, we learn about human as being someone who has been created in the image and likeness of God. And what, what is this image? What are the divine qualities in human? Uh, fathers are saying it's reason, freedom, love, being able to be in relationships. It has changed now, but in the European culture, uh, the notion of education has been mostly linked with molding human after the face of God. But in addition, humans have also been given the task of growing up and achieving the ideal. Humans are grown up when they have achieved the likeness to Christ. Christ has been called the new human, the new Adam. Father John Bear just evoked this. And an ideal human journey of life can um, therefore perhaps be summed up as the path from Adam to Adam. And I believe that in order to embrace this image, we have to use our imagination. Thank you.